And, uh, you know, personally, I've been watching Mike for a very long time, especially that series about the hidden secrets of money, which is amazing and really a lot of my own education about how the Fed works, how the monetary system works comes from Mike. So that being said, Mike, welcome to the show. How are you doing? And uh, what is going on? What is going on right now in the financial markets? Because we're truly living in historic times. Historic times is, is it. Uh... You know, in Puerto Rico here, everything is closed. They've, uh, there was an executive order closing all businesses except for grocery stores, uh, medical supplies, pharmacies. Uh, pretty much just everything is stopped and everybody's, everybody is under quarantine. There's a uh, curfew at night and, and uh, fines are, or six months in jail if you're caught uh, like between 9 p.m. And, and 5 a.m. Uh, driving on the roads and you're not an emergency uh, responder and they actually have been uh, jailing people and so on. So the economy is closed and the ramifications uh, for, and this will be happening all over the world. If it, I, I don't know if it has happened where you're at yet, uh, but uh, everywhere in the world, we're going to see the economies stop. I'm up on the uh, I'm up on the top of a, a high-rise building, and so I can see the freeways and the roads, and the traffic is down to about 10 percent of what it normally is. Uh, oil has fallen down into the low 20s; it's about to touch the teens. You know, years ago, I think it was back in 2014, I was spoke at the uh, banking conference and the annual banking conference in Russia, and. Uh, I predicted that oil would be going down into the 20s, possibly even the even $10 oil. And it did shortly thereafter. I didn't expect it to revisit those levels. But I've always said there's going to be big deflation first and then a hyperinflation as the world's central banks print and print and print to get us out of the problem. It's just that the, the only thing that I didn't see was coronavirus. Um, this, uh, the thing that's happening right now, this was inevitable. This would have happened anyway, as far as the economic collapse that we're going through. And it's the fault of all of the, I, I don't know if your audience knows what Keynesian uh, econo economics is, Yes, but it's the fault of all of the Keynesian central bankers. They do not understand fundamental economics. And uh, so the Keynesian central bankers, when we go into this deflation, they're, they're already out of uh, one type of ammunition, and that's interest rates. They can no longer influence the economy with interest rates because everybody is at zero or slightly negative, and you can't go too negative or everybody just stops uh, depositing currency into checking accounts. By the way, watch episode one of Hidden Secrets of Money. We don't use money. We use currency, national fiat currencies, which are specifically designed to steal wealth from you and to lose value. That's what inflation is, is the, the inflation isn't prices going up. It's the currency going down. It purchases less and less. Uh, so um, uh, in my book back in, you know, I wrote this back in 2005, six and seven that uh, the world would have, there would be this inflation uh, that we had going into the real estate bubble in 2006, five, six, and seven. And then we'd have the threat of deflation, uh, which was the crisis of global financial crisis of 2008. And then there would be a big reflation uh, where they reinflate asset prices, the stock markets, and they've pushed us into the almost everything bubble. Uh, whenever anybody says the everything bubble, they're wrong. There are a few things out there that are not in a bubble, but very few. And then there would be a real deflation, a collapse in prices, a collapse in portions of the currency supply, a collapse in the velocity of currency. And then the response would be to print and print and print and print until deflation gives way. And at that point, uh, there's your audience needs to understand velocity of currency to understand why there can be a hyperinflation 
even if the central banks stop creating currency. And to see that, they need to watch episodes six and seven of Hidden Secrets of Money. And by yeah. the way, Hidden Secrets of Money, uh, you know, we have two full-time animators and uh, uh, my producer, director, Dan Rubach, uh, does all of the editing. And these things are scored with a musical soundtrack. And I mean, it's done to a level that you would expect uh, from uh, good television, not uh, uh, a YouTube thing. Absolutely. And they're free on YouTube. And I, mean, I show, sh show them many times on the channel. And uh, I think many of my audience, people have already checked it out. And it's interesting yeah. how you compared it to the hyperinflation in Germany uh, in, the, in the 30s, that uh, from the beginning, you did not yeah. really experience inflation, even though the central banks were trying to stimulate and print and pay for the war, which they lost this, the First World War. But then as soon as the public got a bit of optimism, then all of that money that was on the sidelines started to go into the economy and that's when prices went up so it, would that be a correct summary or or what is going on with all yes. of this money that is being printed it's just on the sidelines who actually has it why, why is it not well, in the economy what's happening right now uh the the pand coronavirus pandemic is uh scaring a lot of people and uh many of the advanced economies have an aging population here in the united states we call them the baby boomers and so there's uh, a lot of people that are at an age, you know, at a bump in the uh, population that's higher in this age group uh, of people that need to retire very soon. I'm 64. I'm sort of a middle baby boomer. I was born right in the middle of, you know, from World War II to 1962 uh, is the baby boom generation. I was born in 1956, sort of right in the middle of that. And uh, I'm 64, so I, you know, I would normally be looking. I'm not going to retire right away. I sort of enjoy what I do, um, uh, but the all these people need to retire, and they thought they were going to be able to retire, and now they're seeing their retirement accounts evaporate. They're seeing uh, all of their savings. Uh, they're going to see the value of their house plummet. All these things that they had that they thought were the safety uh, for them to be able to retire in the future is going to vanish. And as they print, and you know, we're starting to see where there, there's, the, Milton Friedman was the economist that coined the term helicopter money, where the, the governments just drop money out of helicopters. Well, it doesn't really happen that way. They mail you a check, <laughs> but still it's, currency that nobody worked for. And uh, uh, that's what they're starting to do around the planet. They started it in Hong Kong. They've started it in Australia. They just announced, you know, they've, they're talking about it here in the U.S. Uh, one proposal from one uh, senator, I believe it is, uh, is to uh, send everybody in the United States, every man, woman, and child, $2,000 immediately and then $1,000 per month thereafter until one year after the coronavirus. What they don't realize is that currency isn't wealth. The wealth is the goods and services that we all produce for one another. And currency is a measurement tool and a temporary storage device for that wealth. And as you create more of it, you just make the unit of currency hold less and less and less of that wealth, except these baby boomers that are scared they're going, and, and a lot of people, not just the baby boomers this time, because the coronavirus is going to scare the hell of it out of the entire planet. Doesn't matter what age group. And as you start mailing checks to people, they're not going to go out and spend it and stimulate the economy. What you're, when I do this, that's velocity of currency uh, I'm thinking about. And you need to watch uh, episodes six and seven to understand velocity of currency because the economy. And, and prices are determined by uh, the quantity of currency times the velocity. How well the economy is doing is sort of determined by, by velocity. Prices are determined by a combination of velocity times the quantity. And uh, the velocity is how many times the currency changes hands in a year. I buy something from you, you right. buy something from your neighbor with that same unit of currency. 
uh, if the world's central banks suddenly expand the currency supply of the planet tenfold, but transactions slow down by a factor of 10, nothing happens. And the world's central banks have no control over velocity. They wish and they did. And this velocity has been going down for quite some time. I've seen it on your channel and uh, it, this is still continuing that people are right. not spending that much money. They're, they're hoarding more and more and more. Right. And uh, what we're witnessing right now is a decline in prices. When you look at the stock market is falling, even gold is falling, silver is falling. So how do you no, view gold this? No, gold and silver are not falling. They are All not right. falling. Paper yeah. contracts for gold and silver are falling. All of the real gold and silver is vanishing very, very quickly. Uh, right now, the number of products that, that we can get as a dealer has collapsed to where there's like uh, less than less than 50% of the different products that we were uh, able to get. And Silver Eagles have gone from about 17 bucks to 24 bucks because the US Mint is out of them. Gold and silver are becoming unaffordium and unobtainium very, very quickly. And anybody who thinks that gold is going to stay under $10,000 an ounce is nuts. Gold is going astronomical. This is a, <clears throat> if you look back in history, you can see that there are uh, times when civilizations have collapsed. And it's because uh, mankind tends to build things. We start out with something that's simple and robust and we make every system more and more and more and more complex until it becomes very fragile to where there's the potential of a systemic failure. And that's what we've done with the monetary system. It is so complex that nobody can understand it. I study this every day. I mean, practically every day. I'm on the Federal Reserve's website or the uh, OECD or the IMF or the World Bank. Uh, and looking at charts and trying to figure all of this stuff out, there's nobody at the Federal Reserve or the EC, the European Central Bank that understands the monetary system, yet they're trying to control it. Uh, the so, free markets do a much better job at this. But we, what we are at the end of right now is a 100-year-old debt super cycle that, that is about to collapse, uh, I believe. I mean... Uh, you know, I've, I've tried to put a, um, you know, I try to keep a positive attitude and uh, uh, being invested in precious metals, I know there's a huge wealth transfer coming toward me. It's just that what is the world going to look like after this event? That's what I'm afraid of. It's going to be a far more dangerous place. Uh, a lot of people that are used to being middle class are going to be poor. Uh, the world's central banks are going to start buying financial assets to try and stimulate the economy. But all they do is make the rich richer when they do that. Uh, you'd have to watch uh, Hidden Secrets of Money to understand all of the, uh, that. So, yeah. So that's an interesting point you made that even though when people look up the price of gold and they see the chart, they're looking at paper gold. And if they actually try to get real go gold, it would be basically impossible, like you're saying. So if right. you the price of gold and silver is not falling. It's the price of promises to mm. deliver gold and silver that are written on unlimited quantities. You can make as many futures contracts as you want. It's not limited in supply. Gold and silver right. have to be worked for. They have to be mined, refined, and minted into a coin or poured into a bar. And guess what? Just as everybody wants gold and silver, the supply is going is collapsing because all of these mines are going to get shut down due to coronavirus. They're not going to let a whole bunch of guys go into this shaft all in clo close contact with each other. So... And, and the same thing with the refineries and the mints, the whole supply chain is getting shut down just as everybody wants gold and silver. So if, if, if you think gold and silver is going to stop at $5,000 or $10,000 an ounce, you're out of your mind. It's going to the moon. Uh, we may be seeing a collapse of all fiat currencies globally. It's possible. It's within so the realm of possibility. 
And that's actually the next topic I want to discuss because you mentioned that the Fed is going to try to buy all kinds of assets. And we just saw an hour ago this announcement about the Fed now basically having unlimited QE and doing everything yeah. they can to support the markets. Uh, how would you how would you see the future? I mean, right now they're trying well, to stimulate the stock. The stocks might go up, but they also might just treat it as, a, as bad news because they worry that Fed is doing so much, then something's really right. got to be wrong. So how do you see this transition into a gold system or or something else that you're you're foreseeing in the future they're only going to train they if if we end up back on a gold standard the first thing they're going to try is a uh, um, blockchain based uh, uh, national fiat currencies because once they've got everybody uh, they can really control the population of the planet if they can get all of us to uh, use some sort of cryptocurrency that can be tracked. Uh, uh, and so using free market cryptocurrencies, that is uh, that um, expands our freedom. Uh, if we use national fiat cryptocurrencies, this is very dangerous because they can uh, track every single transaction. They'll know where you are, what you're doing. Uh, and so it's a form of enslavement. Uh, they would try that first because they don't want to give up control. These people that have control do not want to lose that control. Um, the, if we end up with a gold standard, they'll have some control, but they will be very constrained on all of the promises that they can make and all of the deficits. They can't do massive deficit spending. When you, to, on a gold standard, to do deficit spending, you have to borrow from the private sector. When you borrow too much from the private sector, the private sector slows down and therefore taxes fall. And so there's less government revenue. And so uh, it's called crowding out. When you've got a fixed currency supply, it puts a lot of discipline on governments and they can't uh, just spend unlimited quantities of currency anymore. Uh, so they don't want a gold standard, but if nothing else is working, they're going to look around and they'll say, well, what worked before? And that's when they may be forced to go back on some sort of gold standard. But you know, I'm on the record for saying gold standards suck. Gold is great. A gold standard is where they take a national fiat currency and they supposedly back it by gold. And then they reduce the reserve ratio, like, uh, you know, uh, the currencies used to be 100% backed by gold. And then, you know, with the creation of the Federal Reserve, the United States dropped it to 40% backed by gold. And then with the Bretton Woods system, there was no specified and it dropped no specified reserve ratio and it dropped to about 8% before we had to abandon the gold standard because we kept on lying saying this was fully redeemable in gold when it when there was no gold there. And uh and we were able to print excess currency and do all of this deficit spending. And that's what funded the Korean War, Vietnam, Johnson's Great Society, which was a bunch of deficit spending on social programs and so on. And uh, Nixon was forced to, let me see, I think it's episode two of Hidden Secrets of Money where you can see um, uh, a history of, it's 140 years of monetary history in 10 minutes. And it, right. it uh, shows you all of this. Uh, but so and it's all animated, so it, it makes it so that your viewers can take this in very easily. It's easy to understand when you have uh, animations to go with these economic processes. Absolutely. And so what, what we've said just right now is the fact that from the beginning, we had the uh, gold standard and then they debased the currency and then simply uh, even removed the connection to gold altogether. Yeah. And isn't it because gold is difficult to store, it's difficult to transfer, transport, it's difficult to divide. So how do we have global trade? How do we have a, a global uh, economy with it's gold? It's not difficult to store, it's not difficult to transport and it's not difficult to divide. Uh, first of all, I can walk down the street with $100,000 worth of gold in my pockets and nobody will notice. If I try to walk down the street with $100,000 worth of cash, my pockets will be bulging out to, you know, <laughs> it would be pretty darn obvious that I had $100,000 worth of cash. But it's, you can take a, a roll of uh, gold eagles and put them in each pocket 
and uh, uh, very easily uh, goes. And that it's not that heavy. Uh, it, it, it is heavy, uh, but it's not so heavy that you can't just uh, put them in your pockets and have enough. You can walk into a car dealer and buy a car without having to have a suitcase full of cash. Uh, it's just a little tube that looks like a roll of quarters. Um, uh, and we can transfer it digitally by having gold that's in a vault where if, if you took uh, every gram of gold that was in a vault and put serial numbers on it or even nanograms, you could circulate. You, you, I mean, you can put it on a blockchain and you can pay for things in gold digitally and make it fully redeemable so that, you know, if you don't trust the, the digital currency, you just, uh, you know, ask for your gold. That's what our currencies used to be was a, a warehouse receipt for money. Watch episode one of Hidden Secrets of Money, and uh, you'll see that uh, uh, the real money, the gold, was in the vault, and every dollar was just uh, a claim check. So the currency was a claim check on money. So, that, but so if, if, if we redo that, system, if we go back to that system, uh, how do we ensure that history doesn't repeat itself? Because I work a well, lot in you crypto. Can't if and they're going to use yeah. national fiat currencies, national, this is the reason I don't like gold standards is gold standards allow the scam to start all over again. You want real gold, not a gold standard. You want 100% backing. With a gold standard, they're allowed to cheat and do deficit spending, and then they'll change the gold standard. Like, you know, we had the classical gold standard, which was fully backed before World War I. The interwar gold standard, which was about 40% backed and but very poorly designed and fell apart during the Great Depression. The Bretton Woods system, where the US dollar was backed by gold, but with an unspecified amount, and all the other currencies on the planet were backed by the US dollar. And then we've got the global dollar standard now, which was just an accident. It was, you know, there were meetings held to come up with a new world monetary system. Uh, and uh, after the Bretton Woods uh, system ended, we tried to design one. But what happened was uh, the world's central banks had all been flooded with U.S. dollars uh, because of the Bretton Woods system. And so the default was just this accidental monetary system that is very poorly designed. Uh, it, it doesn't seek an equilibrium and a balance constantly. And it has allowed the U.S. to do this massive deficit spending and build up these huge debts that, it, that uh, some sort of fixed monetary system uh, like gold. The, the thing about something like gold is it's fair and even for all countries on the planet. And when one country goes into an economic boom and another country is in a uh, recession or a depression, their prices go down and we start importing stuff from them and pay with gold. Our currency supply shrinks and their currency supply expands and they experience an economic boom. So you have these little booms and busts constantly around, around the whole planet, but it's a self-equalizing mechanism. When you can create continuously create currency out of thin air, which we have done now for, uh, you know, ever since the end of the Bretton Woods system, there's been no constraint on this. Uh, the U.S. being the world's reserve currency, uh, we can continuously uh, uh, import more than we export, and we pay for it <laughs> with pieces of paper where we just write down uh, some, you know, a number with a bunch of zeros behind it. And this is what cracks me up. Zero represents nothing, right? So I can, I can write down a one and I can put as many nothings behind it as you want on a post-it note and I'll hand it to you. Are you going to give me any real goods and services for that? No, you're not going to, you're not that dumb. But so but when, you, it comes putting a, when it comes to a government, putting a picture of a dead guy on a piece <laughs> of paper and a yeah. one and a bunch of zeros behind it, everybody in the world is gullible enough to fall for that one.
and I just don't right. understand it. So you, you don't envision a gold standard because that would be a bad thing because we will see repeat of the history. So you envision instead private corporations giving the services to the public that, for example, you can transfer gold electronically and then if you want, you can redeem the gold. Basically, you'll have a new version of gold banks or will it be banks that will uh, transmit uh, gold worldwide electronically? How do you envision the actual practicalities of using of doing global trade in the future? I don't. I just I know that there's solutions, but I don't like to come out, try and come up with an answer myself because the free market is the best at testing a whole bunch of different things and coming up with the best solution. It's when you have a man made solution that that uh, you protect from all of the outside stresses and testing that you come up. Have you uh, Nisam Talib, Talib uh, wrote a book called Anti Fragile. And uh, something that is um, fragile breaks easy, easily. Something that is robust doesn't want to break. Something that is anti-fragile becomes stronger and stronger as it is stressed from the outside. And that's the way organisms are. Uh, if you've got something that's growing, a, a tree, and uh, soil dries out on one side, it'll extend its roots on the other side and seek water and become stronger for it. Uh, when a human contracts a disease, we create antibodies and we're stronger after that because we now have a resistance to that disease. So natural organisms are anti-fragile and become more robust over time as they have been stressed uh, now and then. But we protect, we design these man-made systems and then protect them from any stress. And the thing about allowing the free market to come up with a system instead of some economist trying to design a system or somebody coming up with an it's best if a bazillion people come up with answers and then we try everything and the one that uh that, you know there's a winner uh after that and the winner is the one that is uh the best at uh holding up under stress at uh, serving this is the free market is what brings you Anything from around the world, I mean, you go into a supermarket or you uh, go on to Amazon.com or, or some website and you order it, and anything of uh, man and uh, the earth and, and, I mean, any food that you want from anywhere in the world can be delivered to your door, you know, all of these products and services. Uh, that's the free market that does that. That isn't government. That isn't one person planning it. One, it's impossible for one person to, uh, you know, I was just, uh, when I was sleeping last night, I've got this <clears throat> mattress that's an um, uh, inner spring mattress. So it's got steel springs, and then it's got this big layer of this uh, gel uh, stuff. It's called a purple mattress. And it's got some layers of foam in it, and it's got cloth on the outside. And I was thinking about, wow, all the plants that have to be grown, and then the synthetic fibers that are oil, and this gel that comes from oil, and the, the steel, and then all of the mines and the farms and the different systems that it takes to create this one thing that everybody takes for granted that we sleep on every night. <laughs> There's no government in the world that could produce one of these without it costing like a billion dollars per mattress. This is the free market uh, and everybody working in their own self-interest to support themselves and their families, uh, working with people that they may may hate. They, they, they you know, they don't know in in China. They don't know any of the Americans or Europeans that are that are buying these products that they're producing. It's the same thing. And and in China, they're buying some resources from Africa and from everywhere around the world. Uh, and so, but we've built these complex uh, supply chains without any backup systems. And we're about to see what happens when this breaks down. We've built an extremely fragile system. And what's even more fragile, though, is the world's monetary system because it's just as fragile as like this supply chain system that we've built around the world for all of the. Uh, the goods that we consume and like pharmaceuticals and everything else, uh, all of the high tech items, we're going to see a huge disruption in that. But when it comes to the financial system, it's just like that. But then you add all of this leverage to it of borrowing to uh, uh, make some extra gains here and, and gains there. I mean, the debt that the world owes 
Uh, so if there's a collapse of it, it's going to be an impl a total implosion. Um, the supply chains could collapse for a little while, but they'll be rebuilt. Um, right. With all of the leverage that we've got, uh, this, if, if this thing uh, collapses, it will be a complete implosion and it will be hard to get it started again. And that is pretty scary because that stops all transactions temporarily. Uh, so, you know, I've got some cryptocurrencies. I've got uh, my gold, my silver. I've got uh, some gold jewelry, which, you know, if one of the things that I'm very worried about is uh, the entire world going very socialist because as people get broke and scared, all these arrogant, strong assholes are going to step forward <laughs> and say, elect me and I'll fix everything for you. Mm. You know, I'll show you the way out of this. I've got this plan and that plan. And uh, uh, what's going to happen is you'll see the rise of a lot of dictators around the world. Uh, we could see uh, a lot more wars. Um, uh, it's, uh, I'm, when, it, when you look around the world, uh, socialism is a very deadly thing and it creates poverty uh, and uh, it's um, all throughout history. Uh, the only thing that creates great prosperity is a free market system. Everything else is just a drag on that. And if you get to the point where uh, governments want to own everything and run everything for you, where we're all going to join together and we're going to share everything, uh, at that point, uh, there's a, a big economic collapse. And all you have to do is hmm. look at the places that have tried it. The Soviet Union, Mao's China right now, Venezuela is going through the final days of, uh, of uh, you know, trying to go socialist. And one of the things about socialism, when everybody, oh, yeah, we're going to take from all those wealthy people that, that created jobs and created businesses, and uh, we're all going to be able to share in the wealth. They call it the wealth, like it's a hmm. static quantity that already exists, and somebody is hoarding this pie. Wealth is created. It doesn't just already exist and somebody has to create it. So we're going to take it from the producers of wealth and we're all going to share it. But one of the things that people don't vote, uh, don't realize when they're voting for it is that there's always somebody poorer than they are standing behind them saying, oh, yeah, I get to <laughs> steal from that That's guy. True. <laughs> That's true. But so, Mike, what, what is your view on crypto and Bitcoin? We see people from your industry, such as Peter Schiff, coming out and attacking Bitcoin now and then. What is your view? Because as I understand, you do have a more balanced view. And as you said yourself, you do uh, hold some crypto. Do you envision a bright future Peter for Schiff Bitcoin as a understand whole? understand crypto, period. He just does not get it. And uh, the thing is that uh, cryptocurrencies are... They, they, <clears throat> This is the free market. This is technology being tested uh, in the free market, and it may end up being the winner. Uh, this is, what Satoshi Nakamoto did for humanity is a huge thing, but you got to watch episode eight of Hidden Secrets of Money to also see the dangers of this, uh, mm -hmm. because once governments get a hold of this, they will be able to track everything that we do and be able to uh, take from us instantly. The second that we uh, create a product or a service and a transaction happens, they'll be able to take whatever they want out of that. They'll be able to do negative interest rates that are severely negative because you don't have the possibility of going and taking cash out of the bank. All transactions have to be done through crypto and they'll try to uh, make barter and uh, and any cash type transactions illegal. Um, so, uh, cryptos. This th it's an amazing, amazing development. I'm personally invested in several different cryptocurrencies. My largest portion of my holdings, though, I keep in precious metals because it's been proven throughout history. Uh, you know, there's five thousand years of of history that you can look back on, and they have never failed. And uh, uh, 
the majority of my holdings are held at Brinks Security in vaults where there's guys with guns guarding it in some of the most secure vaults in the world and it's fully insured and it's highly liquid. I can convert it back to cash and have it back in my bank account quicker than selling a stock and getting that cash back into your bank account. Uh, and uh, so cryptos, I think that they're going to do very well, many of them. Some of them are just, I mean, there's yes, so many, many of them. <laughs> thousands of cryptos now. Some of them are just trash, but others are going to do very, very well during this crisis. And so I'm diversified into cryptos as, and we're also, goldsilver.com is the first precious metals dealer to take cryptocurrencies in exchange for gold and silver. Um, uh, you know, so yeah, right. I've supported it for a long time. I believe in cryptos. I want to see the free market uh, and it's, it's total chaos try all of these different things and come up with a winner. We see some questions in the chat as well. Let's take um, a, a few of them. So one is how do you store your go gold practically for the average person? Because the average person may not uh, be able to afford uh, to send it to a vault like you. And uh, what, is the, what is the best solution for the average person? Well, I keep uh, some where I can get my hands on it. And most of that is in the form of what I call bullion jewelry. Uh, we make uh, gold jewelry. We went to the suppliers that uh, make the chains by, you know, they, they make uh, 500 feet of chain on a spool at a time, and then they sell it to the jewelry suppliers. Uh, we got them to actually make necklaces and stuff for us so that we were able to get it at a much lower cost. Uh, and then uh, we don't, if you go to a jewelry store and you buy gold jewelry, you're going to be paying three, four, five times the cost of the gold content. And so um, I keep some of that at home because one of the things that I am beginning to worry about is nationalization of gold and silver once again. In, in America, there was 50 years where it was illegal for American citizens to own gold. Uh, you couldn't own coins or bars. But if you try to nationalize the jewelry of a nation now you're pissing off the women <laughs> and so throughout history you don't see that happen uh, uh, so it's good to have some gold jewelry uh, where you can get your hands on it and I have a lot I mean I would if if I get on a plane I can put on a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> worth of gold today get on a plane and when you fill out the landing card to enter another country, it asks if you're bringing $10,000 or more of cash or cash equivalents such as stocks and bonds and things like that. Uh, it doesn't ask about jewelry. Uh, there was a famous movie star, Elizabeth Taylor. She used to travel the world with a half million dollars of jewelry on her, and she never had any problem with that, and people still do. Um, so I've got some jewelry as like an emergency thing uh, to sort of protect against nationalization or confiscation. And then I've got a little bit of uh, gold and silver that I can lay my hands on that is not in a vault that's somewhere on the other side of the world. Uh, and then, but the vast majority I keep at Brinks Security, which is not part of the banking system. Uh, we have, you know, we've got uh, uh, over a billion dollars of precious metals uh, under management uh, uh, that is, uh, we open accounts for our customers and the accounts are directly with Brinks. They're not with us. We just do all of the billing for Brinks because that was part of the terms. In order for it to be really inexpensive, we're the ones that have to take on the accounting problems. They didn't want to do that. Uh, so we do that for them. But uh, basically, um, it's, it's there. It's not part of the banking system. So during a bank holiday or shutdown or a financial crisis where uh, the financial system collapses, Brinks is open 364 days per year. Uh, and like I said, it's fully insured. And they can ship it to you within, I believe, 72 hours. Uh, and uh, you can also sell it instantly back to us uh, or 
you know, you can take delivery and send it to another dealer, uh, whatever you want. Uh, and so I keep the vast majority of mine at Brinks. Um, I had some at Brinks Hong Kong, but with what's happening in Hong Kong, I got that out of there. But I've, you know, uh, Brinks Singapore, Brinks Toronto, Brinks Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City is where I have the vast majority of my holdings. Right, so guys, definitely check it out if you're interested in uh, in physical gold. And finally, I know that you have a book. So if people want to learn more and they want to both watch your videos, which I will link below, but also read the book, where can they find the actual book that you that you written? Uh, it's for sale on Amazon. But if you go to my website, goldsilver.com, uh, you can just download it in thirty. You know, in in thirty seconds, you can be reading it. So you go to goldsilver.com, download the book for free. Send it to all of your friends. It's a PDF. Just email it to them. Uh, everything that is in there, you know, almost every question that I've gotten over the past 12, I wrote the book 12 years ago, and then I updated it in 2015. And many, many of the things that I predicted in the book came true in 2008. The rest of the things that I predicted have yet to come true, but they're coming true right now. Um, and uh, like I said, it answers almost every question that I get. Uh, it's uh, very, very pertinent today. Uh, so it'll answer almost every question that you have about uh, precious metals. But the book isn't just a book on investing in precious metals. The first uh, third of it is a history of, uh, it's the history of money and it's short and it's very entertaining. And it shows how these things that have happened throughout history apply to you today. And then the middle third is a, um, a real simple economics and some potential outcomes of uh, what we're going through right now. And it's only the last 20% or so that is actually a, uh, a guide to investing in gold and silver. Uh, and that answers most of your questions of, uh, you know, uh, what scams to, 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 there's a lot of scams out there. So be careful. Uh, there's a lot of overpriced stuff. There's a lot of people that will, uh, are selling fake stuff. We source everything directly from the refineries and the mints and uh, suppliers that deal directly with refineries and mints. And everything that enters the vault system, if it comes uh, from a non mint or uh, refinery, uh, gets assayed before it enters the vault system. So uh, when you're buying from us, it's guaranteed to be real, pure gold and silver. Uh, when you're buying from uh, a, uh, an unknown dealer, you have no idea what they're selling. <laughs> and there's some counterfeits out of China that have gotten pretty good these days. <laughs> so just, uh, you know, for your audience, be careful. But yeah, go to the website, download the book, and then take a look at our news on, on our homepage. Uh, my friend from more, my best friend from more than 50 years has been putting up the news since 2007. For the fir first four years, he didn't take a single day off. He would go, news never sleeps, when I'd say, you got to take, you got to take the weekends off. <laughs> You're going to go nuts. Uh, and so, um, Make sure that uh, they take a look at that news because to come up with 30 stories, he has to read like 300 stories to filter out all of the junk to give your, uh, your viewers uh, the best news that is going to affect their lives on what's going on economically, politically, and in the precious metals sector. So that's goldsilver.com. And to get the book, I see Dave writing here in the chat that it's goldsilver.com slash free book. So I will post it in the chat as well. So Mike, thank you so much for coming onto the show. I really, really enjoyed it. And I see people in the chat enjoyed it as well. And uh, let's stay in touch and see what happens because we're living through historic times. That's for sure. Yes, we are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye.